Today from the book of the Genesis. We haven't often looked at this lesson. In fact, I can tell you that I've never read this lesson in church, and I've never preached on this lesson in church. So you're either going to get a special treat and blessing, or don't know what you're going to call it. We'll see. But this is from the book of Genesis chapter 22. And I would outright tell you that this is probably, at least on the surface, one of the most ungodly, horrendous, and immoral lessons you're ever going to run into in the Scripture. So let's hear from the Scripture and what it has to say to us. Now after these things, God tested Abraham. God said to him, Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice. So that I, that, and the place that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took away two, of, took two of his young men with him, and along with his son. And they cut wood for the burnt offerings. And they set out on a path and went to the place of Moriah, the distance where God had told them to go. On that third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place where they were to take him, the mountaintop. And Abraham said to the young men, "Stay here, along with the donkey." My son and I will go over and we will worship God, and then we'll come back to you. So Abraham took wood and the burnt offering and laid it on the back of his son, and he carried uh, the fire and the knife himself. But the two of them walked along together, but Isaac said to his father, Father, here I am, he said. The fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for burnt offering. So the two of them walked along together a little bit further. And when they came to the place that God had showed them, Abraham built an altar there. He laid wood in order, uh, in order for the sacrifice. And he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife and was about to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, don't lay your hand on your boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld even your son. So Abram looked up and saw the ram caught in the thicket with its thorns. Abram went and took the ram and offered it up as a sacrifice. So Abram called the place the Lord will provide, as it is called to this very day. On the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And so today's lesson I mentioned to you is one of the more unimaginable, horrendous lessons in the Bible immoral lessons, and certainly for those who are agnostics and atheists, one of those lessons they point to and say, how could a God, a loving God, ever ask this of his or her son? And I will confess to you, I've got to kind of agree with that question. We teach a lot of really immoral lessons in our churches sometimes from Bible lessons that we look at and we scratch our head and we just think, well, it's in the Bible, it must be okay. I mean, how many times have you heard in Sunday school the story of Samson? Why would you teach your kid Samson or this lesson where the father is ready to take his son and sacrifice his son? I remember having nightmares about this when I was a six and seven year old, hearing this story in Sunday school, going home and wondering what my parents were carrying underneath their sleeves, that there was a knife they were carrying in their sleeves, and they're going to take and sacrifice me to, to God. And so these are the terrifying things that we're teaching our kids because we don't understand what this, what's going on in this lesson. It's a terrifying, terrible lesson. And remember, when you look at the lesson, it was very clearly God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son. So there's no way to get around this and kind of explain it away. God is taking responsibility for it. Now, that's an unusual thing if you think of Abraham, because Abraham by this point was 100 years of age, or over 100 years of age. He finally had the son he'd hoped for, and he was going to kill his son? Really? This was the promised one whom God promised to bless the nations through? So I will tell you, and I'm outright telling you this, this is my opinion. If God were to come up to me, standing in God's full glory, of course, and kill me, but if God were standing right in front of me and asked me to sacrifice my daughter, I would basically spit in God's face, turn my back on God, and say, you are not worthy of my attention, my devotion. In fact, I'll tell you what, if God were to ask me about Corey, I'd even think about that second or third time. I might, but I, I probably wouldn't even do that. So there is no way that I would sacrifice or kill or maim or hurt anybody. God would not be able to convince me that anybody should be killed by my hand in order to please God. 
So the question is, is how can we reconcile our view of God being a loving God when he has given to Abraham such a despicable request? So let's look at this lesson and what we do know about it, and then I'm hopefully going to break this down and try to figure this one out. First thing we know is some details about who Abraham is and a little bit about him and about his life. And the one thing we know about Abraham is that his response to God's request is really peculiar. It's unusual for a reason. Every single lesson before this, when Abraham has a, or a, a, a conversation, I guess you would say, with God, it is combative. Abraham is combative in nature. He has doubts about what God is asking him. He says, God, I'm not sure about this. He confronts God about Sodom and Gomorrah and says, well, God, I'm not sure you should destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What if there's 50 fable people? Well, God, if I'm unimposing, what if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? So you know, normally see Abraham being really combative about his opinion about God and about what God asked him to do. Or you see Abraham kind of hedging his bets. So God makes a promise and Abraham's like, ah, I'm not sure God can really do that, so I'm going to help God along a little bit. So he's always reaching for a human solution to requests that God makes of him. For instance, when he was told that he would have a, uh, uh, that he was, he would have a son later in his life, he didn't promise God to protect his life. And so here he was, he took his beautiful wife, and by the way, the Bible says she was absolutely gorgeous. She was 65 years of age, by the way, but she was apparently absolutely gorgeous. And they went to Egypt, and uh, he was afraid for his life that, uh, that he would be killed. So he lied about the identity of his wife while in Egypt in order to protect his life, because he didn't trust God enough to take care of him. Oh, but that wasn't the only thing Abraham did. He wanted, when God promised him that he would have a son that would inherit the earth, and uh, fill the earth, he decided that he would help God along a little bit. He decided he would adopt his servant as his own son. And God is like, no, that's not what I said. I said, your son and Sarah's son. So they again try to help God a second time. Well, how about this? Sarah decided to take her servant, Hagar, and say, okay, Hagar will give you a son, and that will be like my son. And God is like, no, that's not what I was saying. I was saying, your biological son, yours and Sarah's son. So you see, he was always trying to help God along. And so again, we also uh, have another story very similar to the one where Abraham lied in Egypt about the identity of his wife because, again, he was afraid of his life. He did this to Abimelech. And so Abraham, you see, all along, he's combative with God. He tries to take control of the situation. He lies about things. He tries to help God uh, with the promises that God has made to him. But what's interesting about this request of God, when Abraham is asked by God to kill his son, the interesting thing is Abraham is rather resigned. He doesn't combat God. He doesn't argue with God. He just says, okay. Like I said, God asked me that, to do that with my daughter. I would spit in God's face. God would not get my devotion. But Abraham, what's interesting about this lesson is it seems like Abraham has learned a lesson from all of the combative nature that he had in his older life, in his previous life, of how he continually confronted God about the things that God said. And he realizes if God makes a promise, God's going to keep it. And he doesn't need Abraham's help. So Abraham knows that Isaac is the son of the promise. Not might be, is. And so he expects that God is going to deliver on his promises despite the unusual request that God makes of him. So what's interesting about this lesson is when Abraham takes uh, Isaac to sacrifice him, he looks at the two servants that he brings along with him, and Abraham doesn't say, I'll be back, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I know, that was pretty bad. He doesn't say, I'll be back. He says, we will be back. In other words, Isaac and I will be back. So Abraham is almost, in one sense, testing God. Okay, God, you say that this boy is the promise? then I'm testing you, God, to see whether you're going to fulfill your, your promise to me or whether you're actually a tyrant. And so he takes his son, but he expects that God is going to do something miraculous or something spectacular because he fully well expects to come back with his son, Isaac, breathing and alive. So that's evident and clear from the context of the lesson. We go to two. Look at number two. What about Isaac? What do we know about Isaac? Now, here's the interesting thing we learned about Isaac. Now, I know you've seen all the movies about the Bible, and every image we have of Isaac 
is that Isaac was maybe four or five years of age. Boulder Dash. That isn't supported by the text of the Old Testament, and it's not supported by the tradition of the Jews. Uh, the text itself uses a very specific word that it refers to him. It refers to him as a lad, L-A-D, okay? Now, the phrase lad, the word lad that it's used of him, it's used of him. It's used of the two servants that Abraham takes with him. Abraham does not take two five-year-olds with him as servants, right? No. No, he takes grown men, grown servants with him. So the word lad means something different than little boy. We also see that word lad, uh, the Hebrew word that we translate, or should be translated lad, would be a better way to do that. Use of the two servants, in particular Joshua, when he goes into the promised land to scout it out for Moses to make sure that it's ready and prepared to be uh, um, occupied, or who's in the land and so forth. And that's use of Joshua. Joshua is not a five-year-old boy. Joshua is a grown butt man, okay? So just from the word itself, the idea or the concept that, that Isaac at this point was a five-year-old boy just doesn't hold water by what the text itself says. Basically, the Bible is saying that he's a young, strapping man. We also know that from the evidence of the passage because who carries the wood? You know, you got to remember, this is a big bundle of wood. You don't put a bundle of wood on a five-year-old's back. Not a wood for a sacrifice. He's got a bunch of wood, and he's carrying it on his back. He's not a five-year-old little boy. Now, it is also clear that Isaac was not only no child, but he was most certainly a young man. Uh, we get this also from tradition. So not only from the biblical text itself, that certainly clearly does not say that he was a little boy, but also from tradition. Josephus, if you remember who he was, he was a Jewish uh, scholar, and he was a historian in the first century A.D., he actually wrote a book called The Antiquities of the Jews. And the tradition that was passed on to him was that Isaac was 25 years of age when the sacrifice took place. 25. Now, if you go back into the Old Testament times to the Jewish Midrash. Now, what's the Jewish Midrash? The Jewish Midrash was the commentary on the Bible, where Jewish rabbis started writing about what they believed the Bible had to say. Mm -hmm. But the Midrash, uh, the commentary on the book of Genesis, states very clearly that their understanding was that Isaac was 37 years of age when this story took place. Not a little boy, a grown butt man who walked side by side with his dad and knew exactly what was going to take place with him. So go over to the next page. Isaac therefore was hardly this unwilling child or innocent participant in the sacrifice that was about to take place. He was fully aware of what was going on. He even carried the wood on his back, as we mentioned to you earlier. He could easily have walked away from his dad and said, I'm not going to let you do this to me. But he didn't. He participated as well because he trusted that he was the heir, the promised one of God. And so God was going to have to prove it to them. So you get what's going on in the lesson? We think this lesson is all about Abraham sacrificing his son. The lesson is really about them trying to make God prove to them that God was as good and loving as he says he was. So this is number three. We finally get to what the lesson is really about, and that's that God provides. As soon as Abraham is ready to take his son, remember, not a little child, this is probably a 27, 30-year-old, 30 35-year-old man at this point, Isaac was, when this story took place. God does not allow any harm to come to Isaac. So ultimately what we learn is that this lesson is not about Abraham, because that's not what the focus of the lesson is. The focus of the lesson is really about God's provision, that God has always got the provision waiting for us when we are, when we are in need. And so Abraham went up in faith to the mountain, knowing that God would provide some type of sacrifice, and it wasn't going to be his son. Even though God asked him to go and sacrifice you know, his son, he knew it couldn't be true. Why? Because he knew that this son was the son that God made a promise to make it, uh, to multiply and bless the nations. So God's provision was waiting for them there. It was a ram caught in the thicket of the bushes and so forth. And so before we even look at it, the Bible tells us, God's provision was already 
uh, provided for Abraham and for Isaac. And so we are told that Abraham names the place <coughs> the Lord will provide. Now that's the Hebrew word, but we translate the Lord will provide. He didn't call it Abraham has performed or was successful or was a good guy or is willing to sacrifice his son. He called it the Lord will provide. So even Abraham gets the point of today's lesson is not about the faithfulness of Abraham, but about the faithfulness of God's provision. So the question then becomes is why would God include this and why would this lesson, which I think sounds like a really immoral lesson, why would it be included in the Bible? And there's a very particular reason, I think because God is trying to make a point. This is not a request that God would make of anybody here. God would never make this request of anybody ever again. The only reason for this was to demonstrate a very particular theology of what God wanted to convince the world of. See, before Abraham, before the covenant that God made with Abraham, here's how the world thought of God. I do something, and if I do something good, God is going to bless me. You see that on Facebook all the time, don't you? Oh, if you send this forward, okay, I know you're on Facebook, some of you are. Okay, if you're on Facebook, actually, there's only, uh, we're, we're split down the middle here. So half of you aren't on Facebook here, here today. Okay, so uh, let me tell you, what happens on Facebook is people put these phrases down. Do you believe that God wants to bless you today? Well, if you send this thing to 10 people, God's going to bless you financially. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's this magical thinking and it's in Christians, and they send around. It's people that I think are goodly, kindly Christians, and they send this crap around. It's ridiculous. They really believe that if you send these chains around a blessing, God is going to bless you. That's called works righteousness. Chain letters. It's chain letters, and this and that. You used to get those back in the old days. You would literally get chain letters mm -hmm. where you had to send ten around, and God would financially bless you or something stupid like that. I am telling you, don't ever pass one of those around and don't ever expect me to pass around. Because even sometimes the messages are kind of cool, cool, but then at the end it says, so if you believe this, pass it around and God will do this for you. No, that's not how it works. God's blessing is not conditional. And that's what this lesson does today. It breaks that whole magical thinking process where I do something and God blesses me. Abraham did not perform the act that he was asked to perform. God just blessed him. And that's the magical thinking that God is trying to get rid of with this lesson in the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. So here's what I think we learn. Note number one. Our family is God's promise to us. I was talking with, us, with my wife yesterday. I think it's important that we get this. Our family is God's promise to us. God would never expect us to sacrifice our family to God. Okay? In fact, the way that we're supposed to be faithful to God, you want to know how to love, your, love God is basically by loving your family. That's how you love God. Okay, number two. The second thing I think that we learned is that God fulfills the promise God made to us, even if it doesn't seem to take place at the time that we think it should take place, or in the time frame it should, or in the way that it should. And for Abraham, often the uh, fulfillment took, takes place, it takes a whole lifetime. And for Abraham, it took after his lifetime for God to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham. Abraham was 100 years of age when, he finally, when God finally fulfilled his promise to give him an heir, Isaac. And you can understand when you're getting to be 85, 90, and you still don't have a son, how Abraham might want to try to help God along a little bit. But when God makes a promise, God will be faithful to deliver on his promises. And we don't have to help God in that case. Abraham finally received the son, but here's the thing. He was promised that his descendants would be uh, would fill the earth. They would multiply and be more numerous than the uh, sands of the sea or the stars in the sky. Okay? Moses, or uh, Moses, Abraham never saw that. Abraham never saw his descendants multiply to the proclivity promised by God. And there's another promise that God made to Abraham. God promised Abraham that his descendants would take possession of the promised land. He never saw that take place. But God was still faithful. So I am telling you, if God makes a promise, God will keep it, but it might not happen at the time of the place or in the time frame that you so desired, but God will fulfill God's promise. And then three, and this is where 
God turns theology on its edge. That conditional theology that all the people before Abraham had, where if you did something, I'm a good person, God will bless me, is turned on its head and broken in completely in entirety, never to come back. So we should not ever participate in any type of conditional theology that, uh, that uh, some Christians want to uh, participate in. After Abraham, our relationship with God is understood to be a free gift. The sacrifice that God provides is something God provided for Abraham. It was not something Abraham had to do. Now, my concern is many congregations still struggle with this conditional theology. How do we do this? I'm going to, I don't want to embarrass any churches, and I'm not trying to shame any or put any down, uh, or any particular denomination. Our denomination has its own stupid things that we do too. But you see some of these things in particular, like in some, ba some Baptist churches. Don't, any, don't ever hear me say, oh, most Baptist churches are great. You see this in some Assemblies of God churches. Most Assemblies of God churches are great, okay? I would never trash your brothers and sisters in Christ, so I hope nobody hears me saying this. But you'll hear this on occasion where you go to some of these churches with some very uneducated pastors who really don't know the Scripture at all, and they'll get up there and say, you got to first do this. You first have to pray the sinner's prayer before God can bless you. You get to a church like that where the pastor's telling you, you got to pray the sinner's prayer before God can bless you. Just walk out the door. Because that pastor doesn't know what he's talking about. You go to a church. Well, uh, you give a certain money, Benny Hinn. Uh, you give a certain amount of money. I keep using Benny Hinn because he's my favorite uh, punching bag. I, I, I cannot tell you how much I loathe the ministry of what this man has done and how he's bastardized the Holy Gospel by the ministry that he ministry is doing. Now, that's not to say that people aren't blessed by him, but are not blessed because of the ministry, but they're blessed by God, not because of Benny Hinn. I think God wants to take them and smack them upside the head. But uh, because Benny Hinn has this thing of, send me $1,000, then you'll receive God's blessing. Send, oh, you didn't get God's blessing when you send $1,000? Send me $10,000 and you'll get God's blessing. Oh, well, you didn't get it because you sent $10,000. It's your attitude that needs to change. Maybe you need to put a second mortgage on your house and send me $100,000. <laughs> then you'll get God's blessing. So Benny Hinn runs to the bank with his $10 million house, okay? And he's rich as, uh, rich as could be, but everybody else that he's supposedly blessing is poor. The, the, this country is filled and littered with people who lost their homes, are broke, and never received that blessing because of the idiocy and lunacy of this man. It is evil and destructive. All right? God never asks us to give something first before he blesses us. He blesses us first, and then we respond. It's not conditional, the blessing of God. It's a free gift. We got others who say, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior before you're going to receive a blessing of God. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Do you know that phrase, you must receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, is never found in the Bible? Not in the Bible anywhere. That's a conditional, magical way of thinking. I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and then God can bless me. That's magical thinking that's broken on the back of this sacrifice in the Old Testament and the story about Abraham, okay? That's not how it works. How it works is God comes 100% of the way from heaven to earth and blesses us. We respond out of gratitude. But wait a minute, I gotta do this. No, as soon as you put, I gotta do this, then you're holding out a part of that blessing from God as your activity. Now I'm saying this again, everybody's gonna nod their head as a Christian. God comes 100% of the way. Yes. But we've got to. As soon as you say we've got to, then you're saying God didn't come 100% of the way. God only came 95% of the way. We have to go 95% of the way to God. No. As soon as you say we've got to, you are putting a condition on us. That's not what God does. God has come 100% of the way. We receive the blessing of God before we pray the sinner's prayer. Before we we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Okay? We receive the blessing of God as a result. Here's the difference. Look at the last one. 
Because see, what we need to do is rethink the way we communicate God, the way we do our theology. And that's what this lesson is about. We need to rethink this. God comes 100% of the way and blesses us. Out of gratitude, we respond. So God has come 100% of the way from heaven to the earth. It's no longer magical thinking. It's a blessing from God. Because God has blessed us, I pray the sinner's prayer. Why? Because I recognize my life hasn't been all together. And I'm so grateful for what God has done. I don't do it in order to please God. I do it because I realize I've been so blessed and I just want to thank God. So I say, God, you know what? I have made a mess in my life. And so I'm confessing to you. Not because I have to to get to heaven. Because I realize I've hurt you. Okay? Same thing's true with having a relationship with Christ. I don't have a relationship with Christ because of anything I've done. Again, 100% done by God. But, because God has blessed me, I want to respond to this relationship that God has with me. I want to give because I want to. Because I'm so grateful. So we need to rethink the way we do theology. It's a radical way of thinking about theology. But that's why this lesson is so important about the sacrifice or attempted sacrifice of Isaac. It again proves that it is God that provides and does the work of salvation and not us. That's why Abraham's hand was spared. So yes, it's an immoral lesson in one sense and it's a request that God would never ask. And that's why I think it's shown and demonstrated this way. It shows the absurdity of it is, it shows the absurdity of trying to do something to get God's pleasure. You couldn't even sacrifice your son and earn God's pleasure. That wouldn't please God. God just wants to bless us with his provision. That's what's being spoken in this lesson. So I'm going to invite you to kind of break this magical thinking right now, this thought process that believes that somehow we do something and God blesses us. It's not the way it works. God blesses us, and out of gratitude, we respond. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. It's a tough lesson because it seems so immoral on the surface, the request that you make of Abraham. But we ask, God, that you help us understand this is a one-shot deal. And it was basically show the absurdity of that magical thinking of us doing something in order to earn God's pleasure. So we pray that you would break us of this theology that still is in our church today. We still don't get it. Christ didn't come 95% of the way. You came 100% of the way. But we still want to hold out that 5% that we do. There's nothing that we can do. It is a free gift of God. And so out of gratitude, we give thanks in Jesus' name.